Welcome to part three of the World War II lecture. In this particular uh, part of the lecture, we'll be examining domestic transformations. I'm Dr. King Owen, and let's begin. One of the first domestic transformations would have to be the story of Rosie the Riveter. As Americans are off at war, women take the controls in the defense industries, and that cannot but have a dramatic impact on women psychologically, emotionally, as well as financially. Um, but we also see that the war actually widens the gap between femininity and masculinity in the sense that men go off and fight, men perform the work of saving the country, and women are, are going to be assigned to only the most dainty and um, really non-dangerous of tasks. So even in the military, women were assigned to do clerical and supply jobs. Their role in the war effort was to not lose their feminine attributes but to maintain them in order to be there for the boys when they came home. The women at work, the Rosies who were riveting uh, the new uh, planes together to send off to the war effort, did find a new sense of independence, that they could do work that you know was normally assigned to guys. And we read plenty of accounts where women talk about how it liberated them um, to feel like they could do more than bake a pie. Um, but that did not alleviate their childcare issues as many women struggled to find adequate childcare during the war. And it certainly didn't protect them from sexism on the job from men who supervised them. And sadly for these Rosie the Riveters, they were fired after the war. So you might have your own man-sized paycheck as this cartoon shows here, but when you're done with the war, it's back to the kitchen with you. Rosies like this African-American Rosie as well as this white Rosie um, did uh, the welding and machine work necessary to build the war materials that kept our boys flying and fighting uh, during the conflict. Um, and certainly that must have built a lot of self-esteem and feelings of independence in them to get a paycheck, to know that you're doing your part uh, for the war effort. And you can do this thing, this job that normally had only gone to men. Yet the propaganda of the time period emphasized uh, women maintaining their femininity. So uh, you are not actually a Marine fighting, you are freeing a Marine to fight. Congratulations, here's your clipboard. And uh, this woman is of course showing her love and devotion for her man that he is volunteering for submarine service. So her benefit to society is the fact that she can love and appreciate him with her femininity. Girls with star-spangled hearts could join the military in the Women's Army Corps, the WACs, or in the Navy, it was known as the WAVES. But keep in mind, these are not combat positions. This woman um, on the assembly line holding something that's not there, uh, she just sort of got her hands in a weird position. Don't know what's going on there, right? Um, she is proud because her husband wants her to do her part. Yeah, because your husband's behind you. And these women are soldiers, but without guns. The most famous image of Rosie during the war is uh, the War Production um, Committee poster, the We Can Do It poster, uh, which 
of course, became the dominant symbol for Rosie the Riveter. It's based on a real person who died not too long ago. Rolling up her sleeve, we can do it. Um, on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, though, Norman Rockwell drew a slightly different Rosie, who is a little less feminine with her men-sized uh, dungarees and quite, quite the gun she's got on here she developed while holding the riveting gun. A song from the time period um, with a very feminine Rosie on the cover talked about how women could contribute to the war effort as Rosie. Um, so I'll quickly sing the song for you. While other girls attend their favorite cocktail bar, sip and dry martinis, munch and caviar, there's a girl who's really putting them to shame. Rosie is her name. All the day long, whether rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie, brr, the riveter. And the brr part is the, the riveting gun. Um, notice down here in this verse, she's got a boyfriend, Charlie. She's doing this for Charlie, for her man. She's standing by her man. She is doing all she can to produce for the war effort. She's got her production E. She's on the B-19. She's not nervous or jittery. She's rosy, Brr, the riveter. What if she's smeared full of oil and grease doing her bit for the old and lease? Well, then she's just amazing. Berlin will hear about her. Moscow will cheer about her. Rosie, the riveter. In terms of African Americans, the story is one of continuing racism and segregation where even U.S. soldiers are going to fight in segregated units. As African Americans search for war jobs, it creates a second great migration. Many African Americans leaving for the North and for California for uh, wartime jobs, but they were met with race riots and conflict as they um, came into these Northern cities and coastal uh, West Coast cities searching for jobs. Um, I will say in the long term, the second great migration of California um, creates uh, the music scene that would give us um, straight out of Compton, for example. You don't have a Compton without the grandparents and, and parents of those people moving to California in the first place. In 1942 in Pittsburgh, uh, a young African-American wrote a newspaper editorial calling for a double V campaign, saying if African-Americans are gonna fight, well, then they ought to fight both Jim Crow and Nazis. It should be a double victory against Nazis and against Jim Crow. After all, Jim Crow is just the American version of Nazism, as one African-American in the time noted. During the war, a new civil rights organization is founded to push for uh, civil rights for African Americans. Its name is CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. And so we can see here in Double V and CORE, the beginnings of the modern civil rights movement. More on that in a future lecture. One of the wildest things that African Americans had to struggle against during the war was segregated blood. The, uh, the Red Cross actually separated white blood from black blood. And so the NAACP had to run a campaign to say, um, it's blood, there's no difference. Um, there's nothing that would prevent you if you were white from getting black blood. It's not gonna be any different. As long as, of course, the antigens and the blood match. Here's a threatened march on Washington poster to abolish um, Jim Crow and the armed forces. Why should Americans march? I love the fact that they are quoting FDR's um, For Freedom speech, freedom from want, freedom from fear, and their third freedom, freedom from Jim Crow. 
So they're going to link their patriotism to a demand for civil rights. Marching again here. Notice the linking of um, Nazism with racism. The Nazis are racist. Jim Crow is racist. So we want a double victory against Jim Crow at home and Nazis abroad. Even Dr. Seuss had something to say about discrimination and racism during the war, noting that African Americans could contribute to the war effort if they were just going to get hired. Um, Dr. Seuss is pointing to the war industry saying, look, buddy, if you want real harmony, you need to use the white and the black keys, black workers and white workers. Propaganda posters like United We Win called upon Americans to set aside their racial prejudices and work together to defeat Nazism. And during the war, uh, one of the most highly decorated African Americans is Dory Miller, who was um, at Pearl Harbor and not really trained to do anything other than sort of like menial tasks, uh, labor tasks, cooking, those sorts of things. But during the attack, actually manned a weapon that he wasn't trained on and helped um, carry the captain of the ship to safety. Um, so he went above and beyond the call of duty and he was awarded the Navy Cross and then later died in the war conflict. Here's the migration of African Americans, mostly um, to the West, to defense plants here in California, outside of Los Angeles and Oakland, um, but also to the North, Detroit will be a site, Cleveland as well. Um, this migration for jobs is very much like the first great migration. Um, and just like the first great migration, African Americans will find the places they go to do have racist people. So there will be race riots, there will be conflict. The story of Japanese Americans is a much more troubled story. Because of Pearl Harbor, hatred of the Japanese was very strong during the war. The people interviewed here in these newspaper pages say things about Japanese such as, you can't trust them, they will stab you in the back every time. We don't want them here in America, they don't belong here in the United States. And this resulted in a particularly heinous policy known as Executive Order 9066, an order that allowed for the relocation and internment of first and second generation Japanese Americans, um, the Nisei and the Issei, who were deemed a threat to security and forced to sell their possessions and move to camps, war camps, relocation camps, almost like a concentration camp, where they were kept under armed guard. They were numbered, so they all had numbers, and they lived in pretty awful abysmal conditions for the duration of the war. This affected about 130,000 Japanese Americans who were treated as if they were traitors to the United States solely because they were Japanese and not because they had done anything actually overtly to betray America. The um, people were confined in really awful conditions under armed guard this was an absolutely atrocious experience for them that the United States deemed necessary as a war-related um, war action. Camps like these became the homes of Japanese Americans 
um, in very, very, very poor conditions in some cases. In some places, they were actually put in animal stables until they were moved to more permanent camps. The camps were located on the interior of the United States away from the coast. So Manzanar, Topaz, Tool Lake, Poston, Gila River, some as far as Arkansas. Anti-Japanese sentiment was strong because of Pearl Harbor and it made Americans feel okay to hate the Japanese. You could join the Slap a Jap Club, get your Jap hunting license. The discrimination against people of Asian descent became so strong that the United States had to create um, directions for how to tell the difference between the Chinese and the Japanese because the Chinese were American allies during the war, whereas the Japanese were not. So that is really telling that you had to instruct Americans on how to tell the difference. More anti-Japanese propaganda. The Tokyo Kid. Notice the mocking drawing, the mocking depiction of uh, this Japanese person here. The fangs. And that helped justify the use of the atomic bomb. Toward the end of the war, Hitler had, uh, had uh, committed suicide in a bunker in Berlin, and the war in Europe was winding down, but the Japanese were continuing to soldier on, and Americans were looking at the potential of do we invade Japan? Do we actually do a mounted amphibious assault? And in the middle of that, Franklin D. Roosevelt died. Warm Springs, Georgia, sitting for a portrait, uh, complained of a headache and passed away. That thrust a very um, relatively inexperienced man named Harry Truman into the presidency. Harry Truman was quite in over his head, um, so much so that he offered sympathies to Eleanor Roosevelt and asked her if he could do anything for her. And she uh, reportedly said to him, no, Harry, is there anything I can do for you? And he quickly had to come up to speed, which brought him knowledge of the Manhattan Project. So as um, Truman takes over the presidency in 1945, he learns that Americans have been developing a fantastic, amazing, heavily destructive weapon. This Manhattan Project, the super secret attempt to harness the power of the atom, has brought America the ability to uh, create an atomic weapon. And the assumption kind of always was that it would be used as uh, payback in Japan, that the Japanese would be receiving the brunt of this weapon for their treachery at Pearl Harbor. And it gave Truman a pretty handy way of ending the war without the need for an invasion. So at the Potsdam Conference of 1945, Truman announced that uh, the U.S. possessed a fantastic weapon, and he did it partially to intimidate the Soviets. Um, so he's trying to make the Soviets shake in their boots, although the Soviets already knew, thanks to their spies. And the bomb is dropped on Japan, first on August 6th, and then again on August 9th in 1945, in order to force the Japanese to uh, fully surrender to the U.S. This brings the war to a conclusion, but with enormous destruction and enormous consequences for the future. So all for the sake of avoiding a, an invasion of Japan, America will dramatically reshape world politics and we will spend the next 45 years, 45 plus years, living with the consequences of nuclear weaponry 
in something known as the Cold War. More on that to come. The men who dropped the bomb flew a plane known as the Enola Gay on their secret mission to uh, let the bomb fall on Jap uh, the Japanese at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The destruction was immense. Only the strongest building survived. The radiation that people experienced uh, was devastating and deadly. Um, it was an absolutely traumatic event for the Japanese. Ground temperatures reached 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit with 980 mile per hour winds, um, killing immediately 70,000 people at Hiroshima, but another 70,000 would die by the end of 1945 from the effects of the bomb. Over time, more people would die, children would be born with birth defects, it would have a lasting impact on Japanese lives. But the world now had peace. And in the aftermath of the war, the League of Nations would be replaced by the United Nations, a much more strong uh, organization to promote the peace of the world. And other new organizations would be created to not only uh, promote peace, but to regulate international economies, to promote trade, free trade around the world, as well as to help countries rebuild from the war. These organizations would take the lead in creating a new post-world world, post-world war world. Whew, that is not easy to say. So with peace would come prosperity as well as the U.S. in charge of rebuilding the world almost in its own image. One of the conferences um, before the end of the war, Yalta, had resulted in the post-war um, decision for how to rebuild the world, uh, particularly with regard to Europe. And this is gonna set us up for eventually the Cold War because Germany will be divided into four zones controlled by the Allies. And then on top of that, um, we're gonna see the Soviets making demands that will promote the security of their own borders. This is a clue about Soviets' future, one that will be driven by paranoia and a fear of future invasion. The Soviets also promised free and open elections in Poland. And in, after, in the after war period, when that doesn't happen, that will become one of the important moves that will push the Soviets and Americans to no longer be allies, but to become enemies in a global conflict that we have called the Cold War. So already in the aftermath of World War II, we are seeing the seed sown of a future conflict in which the United States, largely safe from destruction, largely undamaged, will take the lead in rebuilding the world in the image of America. So the decisions made by these men, the big three, um, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, would have dramatic consequences for the post-war war. None more so than the division of Germany as well as Soviet influence in Poland. So the next time we talk scholars, it will be about the beginnings of this Cold War uh, that will pit the two dominant superpowers of the world against each other with the threat of nuclear annihilation. Until then, take care.